Georgia. Uh, my family's from Nigeria, making me a first generation um, Nigerian American. Uh, went to high school in Georgia. I uh, did my college uh, degree in biochemistry with research distinction at the Ohio State University College, uh, you know, the Ohio State University. And I did medical school at the Ohio State University College of Medicine. And so from there, I mashed into the uh, University of Pittsburgh for general surgery, and now I'm doing CT. Got you. So you, you did your uh, general surgery residency first? Uh, with Correct. Your, how many years was that? Six years? So, so I, did, I, did, I did two years of general surgery. I had a very unique um, circumstance where I did two years of general surgery, and I decided to opt out and go into cardiothoracic surgery a bit sooner. Got you. So uh, an opportunity opened up for me, and I decided to go ahead and pursue that route. Got you. And what was, what was it about CT surgery that got you interested in it? Why, why, why do you, why'd you like it? That's a good question. Um, so actually, when I was in high school, my best friend actually died of what we call hokum, or hypertrophic um, obstructive cardiomyopathy. So he actually died of sudden cardiac death um, following a wrestling practice uh, when I was a ninth grade, yeah, ninth grader. And so that really you know, sparked my interest in the heart. And going into college, my first year, I had the opportunity to work with one of my mentors, Dr. Quinn Capers, who's a cardiologist at OSU, and he introduced me to his cardiac surgery colleagues, and I just started shadowing, and I got really interested in the field, and I really kind of, you know, furthered my interest, and I just carried on since then to medical school and now into residency. Okay. And when I think about busy specialties, uh, surgery is one in general, but cardiothoracic is probably the, probably the busiest people in the hospital. Yeah. Uh, how how uh, true is that? How busy is your schedule? What is like a day-to-day -day, um, for you? Yeah, no, we, we run around a lot. You know, usually a typical day, uh, you know, I'm doing cardiac. A typical day we start, you know, rounds at 6 o'clock in the morning in the ICU. Um, the first case starts at 7, 10, 7.30. Mm -hmm. But usually the night before, you prepare for the cases. So you may have four cases, and so you read extensively on the patient's um, read up on how to do the case. Mm -hmm. Usually you make it a routine to document how you do the surgeries depending on the attending that you're with. So you go back and look at your notes, mm. you know, so you can catch the nuances and the details. But we start making incision at 7.30 a.m. Mm. And so the cases can last anywhere from two hours up to 14. Um, wow. Depending on the nature of the disease, it depends on any, sur any surprises that we see in the OR. And the average day would end around maybe 7, 30, 8 o'clock, um, depending on what's left to do in the hospital. Um, from the thoracic side, more or less the same thing. And so your average day can be about, you know, 14, 16 hours on an average weekday. Usually outside of the hospital, you know, you're expected to read. So, you know, you have to sit on top of the literature, reading articles, reading your textbooks, going over your notes. Mm. You know, pulling away what you learned from that day and documenting areas of weakness. And so, you know, you always find a way to stay on top of your game, even outside of the hospital. Got you. And how many hours is that per week, would you say? It has to be over 100 hours, right? <laughs> yeah, it is within an 80 hour work week. <laughs> it's, it's, it's 80 hours. So, yeah, it's, it's 80 hours. Um, and Ben, and what type of surgeries are you performing for? Uh, you perform or open heart surgery and what, what right. are the surgeries you perform? Yeah, so so we range from open heart surgery, so that can be, you know, what we know as bypasses or cabbage, um, as we talk about in the field, um, aortic valve replacements, mitral valve replacements. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes patients come in with aortic dissections, so you have to replace the aorta. Wow. Um, that's mostly cardiac, and on the thoracic side, we do lung resections for lung cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, my hospital is one of the uh, top uh, hospitals for esophageal disease, and so we perform what we call mainly invasive esophagectomies, or we literally resect parts of the esophagus and reconstruct it. Wow, so we also do lung transplantation, heart transplantation, uh, you know, tracheal disease management. So it's a plethora of uh, diseases that we really address inside the chest, and sometimes we have to go into the belly as well, um, you know, to use sometimes intestine to reconstruct the esophagus. Got you. And I always wondered about this. I'm a I'm a uh, orthopod, so I, I, I yeah. fix bones. But yeah. How do you suture and uh, how do you work on a heart that's beating? So that's a great question. So we have different devices that allows us to keep the heart stationary oh, okay. for a brief second to sew the coronary vessels. Hmm. Um, but yeah, we do something called 
off pump coronary artery bypass. And so the heart's literally beating, but in the moment while you're sewing it, we have devices that keeps the portion that you want to sew stationary so that you can sew. Mm. Uh, but you're always beating against the clock, no pun intended. You know, heart surgery is a very, you know, time conscious yeah. um, specialty. So, you know, you're always, you know, going against the clock, but you but you train long enough to get proficient at that kind of uh, that kind of work. Got you. And can you talk about the process that it takes? You have to do four years of college, four years of medical school, mm -hmm. and then there's a couple different paths you can take to become a CT surgeon? That's correct. So college, usually four to five years, um, with a pre-medical focus. Um, I think some people don't realize that you can special, you can major in anything in college and still go into med school, as long as you have the pre-medical track. Yeah. And so that requires like biology, chemistry, uh, physics. And then from there, you go into medical school, which is usually four years. Mm -hmm. um, we do your first two years, which are usually your preclinical years. Uh, we take your step one exams, which is first of many boards. And then your last two years are mostly clinical focus. And so usually by the end of your third year, you want to have an idea about what you want to do from a specialty standpoint. And so um, by that time, going into your fourth year, you're doing away rotations and your specialty of choice. And usually for cardiothoracic surgery, you can pick a couple of routes. The traditional route is going into general surgery, which is usually five to seven years. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you specialize in your fellowship. In this case, it would be cardiothoracic surgery, which can range from two to four years. Mm -hmm. um, cardiothoracic surgery has multiple fields. There's transplantation, there's pediatrics, and so you can go as far, you know, far as you want um, with additional training. Um, what's been new is what they have called the integrated program in which you can come out of medical school and go directly into CT surgery. So there's over 20 programs in the country that have that route. Um, very competitive. Most places take one candidate a year, or one to two candidates a year, but you go directly through your CT training um, within six to eight years. Wow. Um, and then you can also specialize in congenital or get additional training if need be. So that's, those are the two more popular tracks other programs have what we call four or three, where they mix general surgery and cardiothoracic. But you know that can that's something I can talk to people about offline. But those are the more common tracks to go into the field of cardiothoracic surgery. And speaking about how competitive it is, what kind of uh, recommendations or tips you can provide to someone who's interested in either pre med or medical student? They're applying for residency. What, what would you say? How can they stand out and be successful in getting into that program? Sure. Like many things, st starting early is very important. Um, I had an idea of what I wanted to go into even before starting medical school. Mm -hmm. So I wasted no time and working with um, my department and, you know, the divisions at my university to, to spend time with the CT surgery attendings there, learning, learning their schedules, spending time with the residents. I think that's very important because training is very different than how one will practice after training. So I think it's important that people who are interested get a sense of both, how it is from an attending standpoint and then what the residents do during the process to become or to get to that level of expertise. So I think starting early, getting exposure to the field, I think you know most people have a research background. Mm -hmm. And I think as a medical student, you're naturally a scholar. And so I think it's important to further your academic curiosity about doing research of some sort whether it's at the bench or clinical or a social project, something of research interest. And I think most people who go into CT surgery have that interest. So I think getting published, working in the lab, those things allow you to stand out. But a lot of it comes down to academic performance. Mm -hmm. um, like many other residency programs, there are a lot of people who are interested in the field. And so you have to have your grades, your step one scores, you know, be at the top. And so that's how they, what we call weed out mm -hmm. because of so many applications and no one has time to go through every single one. So I think academic, uh, standing out academically with your, with your grades, research experience, uh, a lot of surgical fields like leaders, you know, whether it's an athlete in athletics or in the community. So it's always, ne it's never too early to be involved in leadership starting in college and learning how to run programs, manage budgets. And so those things allow directors to know, hey, this guy, if he can lead a group of people in a small group, he can lead an OR. You know, he can troubleshoot. He can think through things quickly. 
and manage problems and personalities. And so those things, you know, we look for in training surgical trainees. Got you. And speaking about how busy it is, what do you what do you have to say for people who may be interested in CT surgery, but they're kind of turned away by how busy they may be as a attending or a resident? No, that's a good question. I think it's important to get perspective from different people. Yeah. You know, um, my hospital, we have a lot of thoracic and cardiac surgeons. And so, you know, I have the opportunity to talk to almost all of them and ask them, hey, what is your schedule like? And their schedules are very different. Some people have a very light practice. Mm. You know, they operate three to four days a week, have clinic one or two days mm. um, out of the week. And then the weekends come in for mostly emergency call. And the emergency call is, you know, rotated amongst all the colleagues. And so it may seem busy, but, you know, it can be eight to five if you want it to be. And also that depends on where you work, um, where you work in the country, the demand in your community. So it's a, it's a huge gradient. And so it's not necessarily, you know, 120 hours a week, never sleeping. That's, that, that's definitely a myth. I think it depends on what you want to do. But I think it's important that students who are interested, they speak to, speak to the CT surgeons and to the residents and get an idea of, hey, tell me about your work-life balance. Tell me what you do outside of work. Give me an average day schedule so you can get an idea uh, you know, before you create opinions and, 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 and you know, get an idea of what you want to do in the future. And after you're done with all of your training, your medical school, your residency, and any potential fellowships, how mm -hmm. much can a CT surgeon make? And I know it differs by location. Yeah. What's the yeah. average kind of salary? Um, I would say, you know, north of 400000 500000 on average. Okay. Um, sometimes upward of, you know, 700000 800000 Again, that depends on where you work, you know, the demands in your community, uh, private practice versus academic. Yeah. Um, but, it, you know, it's a well-paying field. It's all, I mean, there's always a need. Yeah. Um, because America is getting older mm -hmm. and there's a lot to discover. And so there's always the need. There's never a shortage of CT surges in this country. Speak this of the world. And the, the fact that it's so busy as a resident, like you say, you have to come home and study for, for cases the next day. You have to read articles. You have to be at work operating. What are some, uh, some hacks, life hacks that you have to remain organized and remain successful in your program? I think one thing to know is that you won't always know everything at the beginning. So I think you have to be very flexible. I'm still learning how to be better at organizing myself because your schedule changes. Mm -hmm. You know, as a student, you live and die by the clock. You know, when the bell rings, you're out of school or the class is over. You know, when you get to medical school, your schedule is a lot more flexible. Mm -hmm. you, know, you're, you know, you're only in class for a few hours and so you have the rest of your day to do whatever you want to do. Um, Residing is almost the same thing. You know, even on the job, it's not a punch in, punch out. You know, when your cases are over, even if they're over at 12 o'clock noon, you may have your whole day to do whatever you want. So that can be going home, taking care of your kids, studying, going to the lab, doing extra cases. Mm -hmm. And so I think the key to staying organized is having an agenda. Mm -hmm. I make a weekly agenda. I have a checkbox about what I want to do. Hey, I want to read this chapter this, this, this week. I want to work on this research paper. Okay, outside of work. I need to do groceries. I need to drive, do my dry cleaners. I need to purchase my airplane ticket to go home for Christmas to see my family. Mm -hmm. oh, my fiance is on call this week, so I should take her out for a date this week. So I think having an agenda and for me writing things down really make things small and less overwhelming for me. Okay. And what other advice would you have to uh, pre-med students out there or just anyone out there? What kind of advice would you, would you give them? So I think the, the, my biggest advice is Keep an open mind. I know everyone says that, but I think it's important as an academic and as a scholar to always learn as much as you can. Even if you want to do CT surgery or pediatrics or ortho, learn as much as you can from everybody because the window gets smaller and smaller as you progress because your time becomes more limited. And so um, knowledge is out there. It is free. I think you have to be very hungry. You have to learn how to ask questions. And again, those are skill sets. Learning how to ask a question to get what you want is a skill set. And so you have to really be ambitious uh, and really stay hungry, stay motivated. Sometimes it's tough to come home and read a chapter. But like I said, staying organized is key. So maybe you don't have to come home and read this entire you know, 20 chapter book in a day. Space it out. Make time to have fun and enjoy your friends and family because again, you have a busy schedule, but there's people who may be supporting, you know, depending on you and, and they, they look to you for advice. And so 
staying grounded and staying humble really kept me going as a resident because being busy can always be an excuse. And so, um, but it's very possible. It's been done before. It's a very achievable goal. But I think the key is staying hungry, happy, and staying organized. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I usually say is that people before me did it, and, you know, I can also. So yeah. uh, three last questions. I asked this about my guests. Uh, you can give a one to two word answer. Sure. Uh, what is your favorite thing to do outside of medicine? I love sports. And I'm, I'm a big NBA fan. Um, I like uh, music. I like jazz. I like some John Coltrane. I like hip hop. And so anything that involves me watching a game, I love going to live sports games of any kind. Uh, you know, like I said, sports and music. So whatever, you know, any of those things, I'm in concerts, going to games. I love doing those things outside of uh, working. Yeah. And who's my friends and family, too. Who's your NBA team? Oh, man. So I'm a Kevin Durant fan. Oh, so, man. Look at that all the time. People say I look like Kevin Durant. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a KD fan, man. So I'm pulling, I'm pulling for him to get that second championship this year. Got you. Um, what is your favorite part of CT surgery? What do you enjoy the most about it? It's it's a th- it's a thinking man's game. Yeah. I mean, you have to really come in prepared. You know, everyone puts focus on the surgery, mm-hmm. but most of the brain work happens before the operating room. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, that goes down to being organized. You have your CT scans, you have your patient charts. When you see your patient in clinic, the disease is there, but you have to treat the person as a whole mm-hmm. um, because these people have lives, they have jobs, they have families, and so before you want to make this big incision. Or get them radiation, you know, they may be 40 years old with three kids and they may be the only parent. So you have to really take into consideration these things before you commit someone to surgery. So I think the, the amount of brain power that's needed, the cerebral aspect of prepping the patient for surgery is actually one of my favorite components of the field. Gotcha. And what is your favorite food? Favorite food, man. <laughs> that's, that's tough. Oh, uh, I'm Nigerian, so I love missing jollof rice. Jollof rice, all right. Cool. Yeah, yeah. But I like spicy food in general, and so I like I like goat chicken, I like curry, I like duck, I, I like everything, man. Yeah, I love, I love Nigerian food. <laughs> um, if, if anyone wants to reach out to you or ask you some further questions, how can they get in hold of you? Sure. So you can follow me on Instagram, um, Ms. Swad underscore md s-u-a-v-e underscore md or you can email me um at c-e-k-e-k-e at gmail.com and, and i'm, I'm pretty responsive description description yeah, there yeah you go, man. thank you so much man you're a big inspiration to uh all of us out here like i said i've never um actually i've only met a few uh cardiothoracic surgeons so it's really inspired to see you in that position uh but thank you so much man for coming on and uh joining us tonight no, Dr. Webb, it was a pleasure. Thanks for having me on, man. And uh, if I can be of any service, let me know. Absolutely. And for everyone else, thank you guys for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe. New videos coming every week. You don't want to miss these videos. Stay tuned. All right.